the Rogue Startups Podcast, where two startup founders are sharing lessons learned and pitfalls to avoid in their online businesses. And now, here's Dave and Craig. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Rogue Startups. This is episode 157. Uh, Happy New Year's to everybody. And uh, Happy New Year's to Dave and our special guest this week, James Kennedy. Dave, Craig, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> You're very welcome. But how come James and I aren't part of everybody? That's what I want to know. <sighs> well, yeah. <laughs> You and we, us three are talking and everybody's listening. I guess that's how it yeah. goes. <laughs> that's how it goes in podcasting. And the guff is coming already. You know, that's in 2019. That's my resolution to give you more shit. That's, that's the only thing on my list. And I'm already. That's a, that's a stout uh, goal there. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I can already check that box off for this week. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, we took, uh, I don't know, two weeks off or whatever around the New Year's. I, for me, uh, it was. Great. I have, uh, so uh, I have installed rescue time on my computer and the week of Christmas, I worked six hours and 12 minutes. Uh, an hour and a half of that was Netflix. So I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I definitely achieved my goal of basically taking the week off, which I'm very proud of. And we had one of our best months ever for Castos um, in December. So I, I have to say starting new year, kind of on a high and uh, both on like the, the personal and professional fronts. Getting back to work this week, we're recording on the, let's say the third, um, have been working quite a bit this week, but it feels good to get back into the swing of things after taking some time off. So how about you guys? Uh, good, uh, good holidays and everything? Yeah, you know, it was uh, a lot of downtime with the family. Uh, you know, I made a resolution like you did to not work a ton. So I, but I also didn't take like the whole span of time off either. Because it turns out that if you're a contractor at my freelance client right now, this is like one of the best times of the year to work <laughs> because it's so damn quiet. So that means that I've got a little bit of bandwidth to do other things while I'm working for them. Uh, which is nice. So I took like four days off for Christmas and four days off around New Year's, which gave me two three-day work weeks, of which this is the second one. So that was nice. Um, And of course, when you're trying to get other things done and other people have downtime, your productivity isn't as high as you'd like it to be. But, you know, there were plenty of lots of year-end catch-up things that I had been letting slide for a long time, like I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I had like six months of credit card transactions I hadn't categorized in Quicken. And I had, mm. <laughs> and of course, being tax season right around the corner here, I was like, oh, hell, I got to get this done now. So we also restarted our YNAB budget because we had let that fall by the wayside for a while. So all of that fell into my lap as the chief financial officer here of the Rodenbaugh household. YNAB drives me crazy. We've been trying YNAB and... Every couple of days, we're trying to reconcile everything. It never matches. It's always like, I don't know what we do. We always get it wrong. And me and my wife are using it. It's, it's good, but it's infuriating. I totally agree with you, James. I'm, you know, we're just getting set back up with it again. And the reason we ended up stopping before was because they didn't have the auto import functionality. And then they mm-hmm. added that in later. And then we just never restarted for a long time. But now, you know, my wife's like, all right, I need to know some hard budget numbers. And I'm like, I can't tell you those numbers unless we go back to YNAB. And she's like, all right, we'll get us back on YNAB. Uh, But now that I'm resetting this back up with like credit cards, it's kind of a pain in the ass to get it all right. And, you know, you have to do it the YNAB way. So, Mm. you know, I I understand why they want to do that and how they want to do that. But, you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And I can tell you that if within three months that we're not, feeling the value out of it, I'm probably going to dump it because it is a lot of effort to get things reconciled and managed. And Mm -hmm. it's a real pain in the ass, like James said. So, Well, my two cents on that, we use Revolut, you know, one of these um, app bank card things and it like pings on your phone every time you spend something. And then I try and do it as we go along because then you're actually making you're realizing you're spending then the budget as you go, not just like at the end of the week, you're like, oh crap, what have we done, you know? So um, 
that helped me a little bit because then now when I'm actually going to spend something, I, I actually have to take out the app and look, well, what money do we have here? You know, do I really want to take this out of my coffee budget? Mm, maybe not. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so in Revolut, budget. you can set up, uh, you can set up the buckets of, you know, this is coffee money and this is kids money and this is, should be savings and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think the idea is you're always taking from something else. If you just have a lump of cash in your bank, then, you know, it's just, oh, I'll just keep spending it until it's gone. But if you have already allocated some of it to your holiday or your whatever, then you're, if you want to spend it, you can, but you're taking it away from your holiday. So it's kind of a psychological hack to stop you from mm. um, mortgaging your kids' futures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids, yeah, we mortgaged those a long time ago. They're gone. Yeah. <laughs> no, that- so, so Dave, you have got to get bench. Uh, I mean, it's the most amazing bookkeeping accounting system ever. It's $100 a month and I literally do no work for all, for for both of my businesses. I do zero work basically ever. They just do everything. They auto categorize everything. It goes to my accountant and he prepares the the taxes and it's all done automatically. It's bench.co. So amazing. It would never, ever, ever manage my own books ever again. Well, our business books are not. So here, here's my dilemma. Since we've gotten into this tangential financial discussion, the work yeah. that primarily that we need in the Rodenbaugh house is um, personal financial stuff. And Bench doesn't really do that. Like they don't. No, totally. I was just talking about your categorizing your credit card transactions. Like that concept doesn't exist in Bench. They just do it for you. Uh, yeah. See, we have to, that's all for, and you know, when you're getting set up in a new system, the problem is, is that they don't understand your automatic transactions like right away. And even Quicken has gotten dumb about this over the years. I've been using Quicken since, I don't know, 1997, no joke. And every two or three years, couple of versions, whenever I upgrade or whenever the financial institutions decide to rename stuff, it just breaks Quicken's renaming engine. So like I have to sit there and recategorize a bunch of stuff that I've already categorized probably half a dozen times. So yeah. that's super frustrating. No. Right, so this will be the last thing I say about this. So with Bench, you have like an onboarding period and they have you go back through your last two months of transactions and categorize everything. And they learn from that and they do everything automatically going forward. It really, it, yeah, for anybody out there, Dave or whoever else, definitely check it out. It's, it's amazing. And it's like a software with a service, like totally awesome. Yeah. We need to get Bench as a sponsor of this thing now. <laughs> totally, totally. Singing their praises. Uh, definitely not Quicken though. I'm not supporting them. So we kind of glossed over James Kennedy. James, you want to give a, a bit of introduction of who you are and uh, kind of what you've been up to lately? Sure. So I'm in the startup for the rest of his tribe, I guess, go to the conferences. And um, I've been um, doing that thing for about 10 years. I lived in Latin America. I did the um, Tim Ferriss for our work week thing for a while and then started drinking too much. So I had to realize I had to fill more, more of my time with something more beneficial. Well, what really happened was I had a kid and I went, holy crap. <laughs> 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 so uh, we started Procurement Express, which is exactly the same age as my five-year-old kid, Max. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're basically a B2B SaaS. We are a, if you, you know, guys know what a purchase order book, you ever seen those purchase order books? Yep. We supply an app. We supply an app that replaces that for mid-sized construction companies and events companies and people like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. And it's about five years old? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, and James spoke at MicroConf Europe this summer in Croatia talking about LinkedIn sales outreach. Is that right? Mm, well, almost. I was due to, and uh, unfortunately, my, I have some sickness in my family. It's the last moment. Um, I wasn't able to go. So um, th- thankfully, you guys are giving me an outlet for all my hard work. <laughs> my so you're the guy. You're <laughs> <laughs> How was that an asshole? Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, so bummer about not being able to go, but I'm glad we got you here because I think, I know Dave, like that we talk a lot about Facebook ads. We had Moitz on a few episodes ago, Facebook, who knows, right? But LinkedIn is kind of like uh, definitely the true B2B space, but something that I think fewer people have cracked. So I think it will be interesting to kind of peel back that a little bit and see what what's out there for different types of businesses, right? 
Absolutely. And I, as we were just saying before we started recording in the episode, that the thing that I think, I, I certainly know that I struggle with this on LinkedIn, and I assume that there's probably others out in our audience that struggle with this as well. It's kind of unclear as to like, when is LinkedIn the best channel or a really good viable channel for my particular space? Because we say B2B, but that's pretty general. And I've tried it B2B for e-commerce and it's been kind of a mixed bag. And so it's one of those, did I screw up with the message? Is it not the right channel? Is it a combination of the two? Do I need to change my last name to Kennedy so I can get this shit right? You know, I honestly have no idea here. So that's one thing that is a question in my mind that I'm hoping, James, you can answer today. I can tell you changing your last name to Kennedy doesn't help. I tried that. <laughs> you can... So, so here's the thing of my take on this. Like, I think all of these things work. It's not so much that we screw up. Like, I've never really made Facebook work either. Um, uh, but it's not so much that we screw up. We just didn't find a message. So it's a mixture of the channel, the message, and the problem you're solving, uh, and the market and the problem you're solving. So there's actually four elements, independent elements there. You only have to get one of them wrong to make it totally fail. So, you know, the thing with Facebook is, are my customers all on Facebook? Yes. Am I able to find them and target them maybe not you know maybe i can i don't know but there's obviously a way of doing it it's just a question of whether you have the fortitude and the money to keep going to or the the, the with the, the sort of the fortitude basically to keep going until you crack that code so when i hear like i heard mike on the show a couple of weeks ago you know and she obviously does this week in week out with clients and gets success so i do believe it, it works it's just a question of getting that mixture right, you know, and doing enough of it, like not half-assing it. That's the, that's the big thing I did with LinkedIn for sure. For years, people would say to me, hey, LinkedIn's great. Aren't you getting customers on LinkedIn? You have a B2B kind of app. Surely, you know, B2B, LinkedIn is the B2B thing. And what I would do is I would come back from a conference like uh, MicroConf. I would sit down and uh, I would you know, mess around in, on LinkedIn for a couple of hours. Nothing would happen. And then I'd just say, well, that's that doesn't work. Um, so it wasn't until like earlier this summer or maybe early this year, I read a book called the EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System for another another reason. It's, another, it's one of these books on how to run a business. And they have a slightly different strategy, which is instead of you know, trying to find new customers all the time, um, they say, well, listen, just decide what your market is. Decide, okay, I want to have a thousand customers. That uh, means I need a, a, time, a total addressable market of around 50,000 or 10,000 or 15,000, whatever you think that is. And then instead of trying to go find new people all the time, just decide, buy that list, do whatever, and just work that list over and over. And when I read that in, in the US book, it's very different to how you know us digital marketers, or I had certainly thought of been doing it to date. You know, I'm always looking for new leads, fresh leads. And this idea of picking your t your ideal customer you know you can do a good job for uh, and then just repeatedly going after them over time that that clicks with me so i think that makes a lot of sense and that's kind of what we're doing with linkedin now with does this change if you you know say are a, a consulting firm and your average kind of contract size is 10 grand or something to to develop you know an mvp application or if you're you know Dave with a SaaS application that's 50 bucks a month. Um, d d does the um, feasibility hmm. of, of of an approach like this work for both use cases? Well, what really got me, what switched me on to this was, well, someone linked, connect with me in LinkedIn at the beginning of the year and they're, Unlike most like um, titles on LinkedIn, which is you know CEO, SaaS company, or you know business coach or whatever, and um, this guy connected with me. And he said, "I help um, you know uh, sub million dollar SaaS businesses grow to twenty five million, right?" And that was his job title on LinkedIn. And that was the little only thing I could read about him. And I was like, "Wow, that's genius!" There's no way I cannot not connect with this guy. I run a SaaS business. I would love to have a $25 million business, which I don't. So, um, and that's what sort of set a light for me. I think it definitely works, but there's a few tweaks on the way you use it. So for, it's not about, like most people are on LinkedIn are 
you know, they're looking for a job or, you know, it's, it's a job platform, right? It's where you're, you're online CV more or less. So that's good. That's cool. But don't get tricked into following them. What you need to do is you need to instead look at it like a landing page, look at your LinkedIn profile, like a landing page. And that job description, that little description they give you, like that, whatever it is, about 50, 50 letters, I guess, um, that you see when someone tries to connect with you, that's the most important thing. And if you change that, and if you're a consultant to answer your question directly, you know, you deliver value to someone, right? So you do a specific job. I know someone give me an example here of the value you deliver as a consultant. If you're talking about a software consulting thing here, uh, let's say you hmm. bring in your expertise as a senior developer, whereas they might be a shop that doesn't have a lot of good software project management, for example. Yeah, okay, that's a great example, right? So don't say you're a senior software project manager. You know, you want to say, uh, I help, uh, I help subpar products. To, you know, or I help pro uh, software products that are getting beaten by beaten by the competition become world class. Or, you know, I if you've never had, uh, uh, you know, worked with a software developer that could speak business, I'm your man. You know, something that gets more to the not the job title, but the value to live you deliver, right? So, for me. You know, I like, you know, I'm CEO of a SaaS company, you know, but I don't say that. I'm going to say I help, you know, uh, mid-sized construction companies save 10% on their overhead spend, right? So if you're in a running a construction company, hopefully you read that, you go, well, an extra 10% profit, I'll take that. I might as well connect with this guy. So the, the great thing is everyone has some value like that, right? At the end of the day, it's not what you do, it's the value, but it's like the, the value you deliver, the, the, you know, that, that, and that's going to be different for everyone, but everyone has something. So I can see this, I mean, I can see this working way better for consultants than people with SaaS businesses. I haven't proven that, honestly. Well, I have, I've kind of seen that a little bit uh, with, with some people I've worked with on this who are, um, like I work with some people who, um, you know, they do this for, for other people. They do LinkedIn prospecting. And, they, and when they do this, they have like a 70% connection rate. So when they send out, they'll say, you know, I help find leads for you on LinkedIn. Now, if someone's on LinkedIn and they're a CEO or they're trying to grow a business, pretty likely they are there to try and find leads. So if someone connects with you saying, I help you find leads, doing, I help you do exactly what you're doing, you're going to get like a 50, 70% connection rate acceptance rate you know um but everyone's going to be different and the numbers are obviously going to be different like me on the on our software side our numbers are far, far more like 30 percent but that's okay so like in in our funnel looks like something like you know we connect to 100 people 30 people accept you know and and that strap line that i come up with i'm always trying to a b test or work that to, to get that number up 30 percent accept and then five get into some kind of sales conversation you know of which we aim to close one or two so and that and what is that what does that that part of the funnel look like so you send out 100 requests 30% accept hmm. then what to get to get them onto an email list or a calendly whatever yeah so so you do um uh, so that uh, exactly what we do is we um uh, I prefer doing it with spreadsheet. There are tools out there and I've got some of them here we can talk about later, but exactly using a spreadsheet. Start off with Sales Navigator, which is 80 bucks a month, and um, decide, okay, what is the market size that makes sense for me? So like, uh, Craig, how many customers do you want in three years time, roughly? Oh, for Podcast Motor, yeah. uh, like 100 customers. 100 customers, perfect, okay. so. That funnel, let's just take the standard funnel, 30% accept, 2% 2, 2 you know, become a customer, means uh, that you're going to need 50, you're going to connect to 50 people before you get a, a single customer. So that's 5,000 people that you need in a sort of addressable market on, link, on LinkedIn, right? Mm -hmm. Not that big, very, very, you know, very achievable. Now you dive into Sales Navigator. You guys have used this, right? It's amazing. You can go in and you can say exactly, okay, I am looking for, I mean, who is your ideal customer there? Tell me a bit more about it. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, businesses that run a podcast. Okay, perfect. Okay, so then you go into Sales Navigator, you go uh, in the keyword search, you put in podcast, uh, and then you... Um, uh, then that, that'll actually tell you how many search results you get. I guess you're not going to get that many for that keyword, you may or may not, but it'll tell you you got 300, you got 500, you got whatever. 
then you, what you do is you, you tweak it a bit. And you say, okay, let's say you only get hundreds of results for that. Well, that's not 5,000. It's not a big enough market for me to do this. So you have to say, okay, well, within my customers, who am I most successful for? You know, what's the job title of the person I normally deal with? Is it the marketing manager or is it the uh, CEO founder? What, what, what uh, job title? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the size of the company, right? I mean, in a small company, it's the founder and a bigger company, it's like marketing manager. Okay, so what's your idea? What's your best customer, the marketing manager or the CEO founder? Uh, marketing manager. Oh, for they're sure. more organized. For sure, for sure. And they're, and they're a disorganized founder. I'm not French, but they don't work as hard. So I'll be happy for you to do some of the work. So yeah. So you can uh, see, so then you go in, okay, marketing manager, boom, there's instantly like 3 million results for that. Okay, that's way too big. Well, what are we going to do? Okay, let's cut that down by digital marketer, marketing manager. Okay, that's given us a million. You get the idea here. And then yeah. what you do is you get it down to the, exactly the size, not just the Goldilocks principle. Not too big, not too small. For your business, you're looking for a hundred customers. You're trying to get it to a nice tight five thousand that you can have some unique value for. So, you know, why not do it for digital marketing managers in France? That's probably sounds about five thousand people. You know, you just. But the point is, sales man, sales navigator tells you exactly right. And once you figure that out, if you follow the EOS model, that's in theory the last lead prospecting you ever need to do. <laughs> if it works, right? <laughs> you can shut down your AdWords. You can stop looking for new leads. You can decide, okay, I'm. if you're dead certain, you can provide value for the 5,000 people in that group. And, you know, there's obviously, you have to craft that. But because it's such a tight group, you can craft it. You can make it, you know, you can just go after marketing manager's first name of James, you know? And then in your mm. your strap line, in your, in your description, you say, I work with marketing managers called James who want to run a podcast, right? If my name's James, I got a, that connection. I'd be like, holy shit, I'm definitely connecting with this guy, you know? Even just for the fact that it's so totally focused on, you know, who I am by name. And that sounds a little bit flippant, but I've always wanted to try that, actually, because you can filter by first name as well, you know? Because who knows? It might work. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. the first step, right? So and no matter what business you're in, I believe, I'm pretty sure you... you you can do that part, whatever about the rest of it, that part, you can find a list of your ideal customers using Sales Navigator. And so, you know, let's say, you know, so for Podcast Motor, you know, we're whatever, $500 a month plus, but for a SaaS application that's $20 a month, people out there are listening like, yeah, that's great, James, but you're full of shit. Like I'd have to have 10,000 potential leads to get, you know, my hundred I need a month in the door. Um, is do you find the process scalable like that? Like, can you manage that kind of volume with with LinkedIn outreach? Well, you do the um, so we're doing. I'm doing. I'm just pulling up numbers here for the campaign we're running for Procurement Express right now. If I can find it, but off the top of my head, in the last month we've done about. Um, I don't want to tell a lie here. It's in the order of about ten thousand connections. Um, wow. And we do that using a mixture of tools. So, you know, there used to be a tool called JetBuzz that got shut down. We have another tool that we use. There's some tools out there. I, I haven't used the other one, so I don't want to recommend it. But you just Google, like, uh, there's there's sales, there's, there's a couple of them out there. And they will automate what I'm talking about here. So you can go in and you can, uh, you know, basically define exactly your target market using Sales Navigator, upload that list. And it will start sending out like drip messages to those people, you know, like an invite message with a connect message. And then if they accept, they'll get a follow up message and so on and so forth. And you can send as many sort of trip sequences in that if you want. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, I definitely wouldn't do the tool first. And it's not that hard. You know, you can either get a virt It's This thing is very virtual assistant. Sizable, if that's the word, right? So <laughs> it's a new verb for okay. 2019. Virtual assistantizable. Yeah. So you just you come up with the spreadsheet, you do the sales process or the sales navigator bit, you export it using a tool like Lucia.co, it will export it all for you if you want. Then you get it in a spreadsheet, then you you do the video, tell the sale um, you know, a, a digital assistant or a remote assistant to basically go through and just, you know, connect to people. They can do, even if by hand, they can do about a hundred a day uh, manually, if you like. Um, probably a bit more, but that territory. 
So for your numbers there, five, if you want a hundred new leads a month, so that's 5,000, so that's 100, what's, that's about 2,000 a month. So you'd need two digital assistants doing that full time to, to get your 5,000 a month. But yeah, you, you just do the numbers, right? So is it no work? Absolutely not. Um, but it's quite, you know, it's not rocket science. Uh, and in fact, isn't there some comfort in doing something that other people aren't willing to do the work on? I find that, you know. Uh, sure, absolutely. Now, I, I want to go back to a statement that you made earlier, which has to do with how long it kind of takes to dial this in. So you're kind of talking about farther down the process where you've got it dialed in, you can create a little helper video for the VA to follow this process. How long have you found that it takes to dial this in? Because you've got to get all those multiple dimensions right. You've got to get the audience. You've got to get the message. You've got to get the timing. You've got to get the roles. All of those things. Like how long did it take you to figure that out and nail it to the point where you felt it was virtual assistantizable? <laughs> okay, so let me let me talk in firm examples here, right? So just in October, we were going after bursars. A bursar is a kind of CFO in a private school in England. It's a role, right? So schools are some of our customers. And um, we went out and what we did is we set up two, we had two profiles, mine and Rich, my business partners, two different kind of value props in our description of what we do for them. And at two different um, messages in the connection request. And so when you send a connection request, you can send a short message. So using that, it's pretty, actually, it took us about, uh, it took us about three weeks to realize that we were getting about a 5% connection rate with the messages we were trying, you know, between five, maybe 10 at the, at the higher end. So that rule of thumb told me that wasn't really working. And also we found it hard to find enough bursars to run that campaign on. So it took us about six weeks. Well, in fairness, we fucked it up for about four weeks and then we started again. And then it took us about six weeks after that to, uh, to really discover that, you know what, this bursar thing isn't going to work. So we switched it over to, you know, CFOs in mid-size, you know, construction companies with 20 to 500 employees or 50 to 500 employees, um, you know, and we did it by geography. And then, then we were suddenly getting 20 to 30% connection, 20% correction, connection rate. So that's double. So that was another sort of three to four weeks because we we're getting a bit better at it then. So, uh, how long it takes to find your message, I have no idea, but I would say it takes about three weeks to test a message or a couple of messages, you know? Um, so budget, let's say a month, a market, you know? So, uh, but the great thing about it is that, I mean, once you define, because that job title is very powerful. Like in your B2B, normally the job title tells you a lot about what people need to achieve and what you can do for them. And, that means that you can cycle through different job titles and you know the, you know exactly what message is going to the right job title. So for Facebook, I always find it a little bit vague as to, I've written a, a message, but is this really going to the right audience here? I don't know. It's, you know, it's a retargeting audience. It's a mishmash of everyone who's been on my website or it's a, you know some sort of interest-based our um, uh, audience, but you know that that's not as good as a job title because the job title tells me a lot about what they need to achieve in their business, and you can do that to a lesser extent on Facebook. Like I said, I've never made that work, but for LinkedIn, you definitely know, right? You definitely know you've got the right job title. If you put the put the right job title on their profile. You definitely know exactly exactly what size of company they're in. You should know exactly what sort of size of company you go for. You know at least the audience is correct right? Which takes one of those like uh, spinning wheels out of the equation. So that thing should be dialed in because it's pretty certain. Next thing is just a question on whether your product actually delivers any value for that person, which are the next two sort of variables. The other thing I like about this is the, you talking about like the investment that it takes to figure out if this works or not. And a lot of it is just time, which I think for most of us, we have more time and creativity than we have money. So as opposed to you were talking about like taking the experiencing the pain to make Facebook ads work, that's time, but it's a lot of money usually too, to make the Facebook ads work. This is just mostly time, right? I mean, it's $80 for, uh, uh, what you would mm. call it, uh, the LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn helper or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, 
and maybe another application to 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 run these drip campaigns and and send the automatic connection requests. A hundred dollars a month is nothing for a marketing channel for your business, um, and and a little bit of you know trial and error and, and sweat equity that you're putting in. Um, yeah, and the other thing, I mean, this is a side benefit, but like Facebook, you spend the money, it's gone. Yeah. Afterwards, it's gone. You know, after this, you at least have a couple of hundred extra connections for people who are vaguely in the right target yeah. market. You know, so now you're pumping out your content marketing, everything else. You start putting that into your feed. You, you know, you're building some kind of following there. So, you know, it's not totally, it's never a total waste, I don't think. And I have seen, you know, in other businesses that you know, the conversion rate for a particular target will definitely increase over time. So month one, mm. it's a bust. But you know what? Six months later, I, I run one voiceover business where in the first month, a lead was like 10% likely to to buy, like one in 10 people would buy, maybe even one in five. By by month 10 or 12, they were like up at some months, it was 80, 90% of them had bought. But um, but you never, very rarely stick with it long enough <laughs> to get to the 80, 90% or have the systems in place to track yeah. that properly. So I'm a fan of, you know, stop chasing your tail, looking for new leads all the time, you know, get your leads, put them in a funnel, just, you know, and, and, you know, keep working on them, working on them. And, and that kind of uh, benefit over time is the opposite of the saturation effect that you hear about with Facebook, that the, the more you try to scale up your Facebook ad spend, the worse the results get. You hear that from a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. let me, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Steli FD and the whole, you know, follow up until they tell you to fuck off or say yes. And mm. I mean, how, how far are you taking it here? Like how many times are you following up and what do those follow ups look like? Is there like some intense sequence up front and then you like spread it out over time and what, you know, what have you found to be, successful for your market knowing of course that every market is a little bit different but i'm just curious as to like if i were to start doing this how long should i be pounding that set of customers for and at what intervals have you found that are you know not pissing them off yeah so i know listen i'm a big huge fan of follow-ups and i've done an insane amount of phone calls in my time uh, and our company definitely does a lot of phone calls but uh you know, I think Sally's fat wrong when it comes to follow up forever. Like the stats out there show that, you know, seven to nine times, like the attitude is 100% correct, right? The attitude is fucking just do what it takes. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with that. But statistically, you look, everything I've read says seven to nine, seven to nine follow ups is, you know, you're, you're approaching, uh, you're maxing out on that and you will get the outliers like i've done it before where and it's very satisfying to follow up with someone for three years and have finally have them buy but um that is the uh, that, that dave's going to come down to your bandwidth right so how much can you afford now to how much how much time can you afford to put into like you should be calling all day long you know that right um so but you can't. So it's just a question of a filter. So you got to decide. In our case, you know, if we if they put their hand up, basically, if they accept the connection request, that's it. They're mine. Now they go into my permanent list of someone who is vaguely interested in the product that I, sh I should be able to serve. So and my strategy going forward in fairness which is something a little bit newer for me is that as soon as they accept a con connection request they go in my permanent marketing list so obviously i'm doing things like you know we get into a bit of a sales conversation and say hey could, do you mind if i send you some email or you know try and get, try and move it over to email obviously trying to get it onto a call or you know in preference i'm always a big fan of calls straight away so like you know if someone accepts you know, they've expressed some interest in what you're doing. He says, oh, this is great. You know, kind of kind of get on a call just to tell you quickly what we do. You know, it's probably going to be quicker than back and forth an email, something like that. So I don't know if I answer your question directly there, Dave. Yeah, I'm, so, I mean, I, I've seen the same statistic on the seven to nine, and that's usually where my bandwidth is just, I'm tapped out and I can't do anymore. Like after, after seven to nine times, my, my morale is at an all time low there. And I'm like, okay, they're not going to do it. I'm just, you know, I, I'm behind Steli a hundred percent, but there's, there's only so much that I can beat that dead horse before I feel like I'm wasting my time. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, okay. That's good. Um, but like, 
the other way to look at the other way to look at this is I mean this stuff is pretty low cost so you can get put your hand up and get some help like you can get someone to do some follow ups for you like you know you're going to be doing a campaign on Facebook and it can run to hundreds if not thousands pretty quickly maybe you know I'm perfectly happy to put some money behind doing some of the manual stuff on this sort of thing because I'm not spending it on the ad spend. So, and I, and I have a CPA, like I know what I'm willing to pay to acquire a customer. I have that, that attitude in general though. Like I'm no problem spending money to acquire a customer. As long as I'm buying customers for, you know, less than a grand in my case, you know, I'm happy I'll do it all day long. So, and every business is different and so on, but you know, you can, you can, you don't have to be a hero. You can ask for help. You can get people to do the calls. You can get people to do a lot of this manual work and stuff like that. Which is good because <laughs> it's a lot of work. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I think a lot of people look at this, at Dave and I included probably, I mean, I've done a little bit of this with Podcast Motor um, and the, the, the question that I have kind of as I look at, you know, virtual assistantizing this is like, what is, when are you able to, to hand this off? Because I mean, I think the thing everybody wants is like a repeatable, scalable process that you don't have to do. At what point do you feel like you have this dialed in to where you can offload this? And for how long or at what point should you as the kind of founder and creative person stay involved in this to, to, to decide that you're making it work? Well, personally, I don't do, I've never done any of the grunt work up front. You know, like I would design the thing, look at the messages, work on the copywriting, get everyone to do, the, the, some of the tools that are there do a lot mm. of it for you. Like you can set up a campaign to do, to like connect to like a couple hundred people in about 15 minutes, I think. I haven't, I, haven't done, I have someone who does that, but it, it tell me it's about, you know, less than half an hour to set up a campaign. So you can easily do it. Um, but I would say, no, don't, you know, don't uh, just get some get some help on it. And it's because, like I say, it's like I sent you guys a document that maybe we can share later on, and it's all laid out exactly what you have to do there. You just give that to your VA, and um, you know, as long as you've done the messages and so on, that's mostly the training, and that's what I do. I mean, I wouldn't burn yourself out on this. So someone takes control. I give someone control of my LinkedIn account, basically. They do the connection request for me. It's only when people respond to um, with, with an expressive expression of interest, and I will handle that. So, out of my hundred connections, you know, I'm getting up to five sort of expressions of interest. Yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. I'm dealing every sing single one of those, but nothing before that. So, if you look at it that way, that's like five to ten. You know, it's probably half an hour of messaging people each day on LinkedIn. It looks more as long as someone else is doing the setup and doing the connection stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Even if you use a tool, it's called an hour. If you use a tool, do it all by yourself. It's called an hour a day. I think you do this for three months and see if it's going to work for you. Yeah. And you're doing the, the follow up with those folks in LinkedIn or do you get them to email as soon as you can? Yeah, I get them to email, get them to the phone in my case. It's going to be different, obviously. Yeah. But someone who's someone who's serious, I think, is going to be happy to. It's not, for a lot of this stuff, especially if you pitch yourself as someone. I wouldn't necessarily scream about the fact you're selling software. I would say that you're solving the problem. Whatever the problem your software solves, say I'm a consultant, effectively, who do, who solves that problem. I think you're going to be more likely to get people into a conversation then. Mm. And then, say, and then when you're in the conversation, you say, okay, great. I, I, you know what? I actually do a brilliant job. And how I fix this problem for people is I use this software, whatever, whatever, you know? As long as you, obviously, caveat being, you actually have to be able to do what you say you can do. But, yeah. It's fascinating. I love it. <laughs> I've heard of this uh, approach a few times from some folks I've been in mastermind groups with and have never cracked it. But, uh, yeah, I love it. I love the idea. Hmm. What stopped you? Is it the... Is it the work aspect of it or the, like, how do you, as was it organized? Did you have it in a spreadsheet? Were you tracking it? No, of course not. No, just <laughs> <laughs> totally fucking unorganized. Just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. I mean, that's, that's the thing for me. Once I see it in the spreadsheet, I'm looking at a spreadsheet in front of me right now. It has all the different messages, has all of the, you know, connection rates and stuff like this. And then it, you know, and then you might as well, this is something you cannot do. You can't do five or 50 connection requests and then think you've done it. 
you know you got to do thousands and whatever and then you got to set out and if you're not if you're not going to do that uh you know which potentially could be you know an hour a day or whatever you know you do your own math on how long it takes you to do it but uh, mm -hmm. you might as well decide you got to decide up front like you have this cheesy self-help expression you know once a month you get to be the general the rest of the month you're the soldier so once a month you decide okay this is what we're going to do and the rest of the month you don't change your mind if i said i was going to do an hour a day of linkedin prospecting i'm doing an hour a day until it's finished until the month or three months or whatever then you get to be the general again you get to decide again what you want to change but until then you just don't change just keep doing uh, so I know uh, a couple of folks that do this like as a service in, uh, you know, productized service in this space. Have you worked with any of them or any that you would recommend people reach out to if they wanted to offload the, the whole process to someone else? So I, I have worked, I've never worked with anyone else. I've done, on, done this and I am affiliated with a thing called nerdacademy.co.za, which is, um, you know, a team down in South Africa, virtual assistants. And uh, I don't make any money from this thing whatsoever, but I am, I coach them and they do this sort of thing for clients quite successfully. Um, and I think it's, you know, uh, I think we're going to give away the process anyway. So you can do it yourself or you can get your own VA to do it or, People at nerdacademy.co.za have, you know, been doing this all day long for months, so they are pretty good at it, mm. and um, they're, you know, pretty pretty reasonable as well. So, um, they're the they're the only people I know of. I, I would say I'm pretty sure any consultant who says they can do this, they can do it. It's not rocket science. You just or need organization. Obviously, you need to make sure the work was done. That's the biggest thing, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're working with someone. My go-to is just have a, a live Google Sheet, and then you can see the, the progress on the sheet as it's getting done, just so you know it's getting done. If you know the get, work's getting done, then it's down to the messaging and the copywriting, and maybe, you know, at least you know, okay, this work was done. Can you share how much, like, top line this is driven to your business? I can tell you that. Um, you can give a percent. I mean, even if it's yeah. most of it or, Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, I can tell you that we have done in the last two months, we've driven, driven nine demos for our software. Um, and in the last two months, that should turn into about four sales for us, you know, so that's as much as I can tell you. But um, I can't, I mean, I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Like I've seen it work working for you know i've seen it working for a lot of folks so i'm convinced i can see it working really well like the great thing about our product is that no one shops for purchase order software for fun right so if you're willing mm -hmm. to come and do a demo with me about that subject you're definitely <laughs> you definitely got a need so um i uh, yeah so for us it it's working I'm sure it's 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 a good strategy. I think for bootstrappers, it's good because there's a low cost involved. Um, yeah. And I once I read this EOS book, Entrepreneurial Operating System, I was really enamored with this idea of listen, if you just want a hundred customers total, then don't you know just can't find a market five thousand big. That's all you need. You know, it makes everything else so much cheaper and easier, so much more easier to be relevant. Um and uh, and rather than running around like a you know a crazy person trying to find new leads all the time, you know, uh, instead just say, well, listen, if if I had you know if I had a room full of five thousand CFO construction uh, CFOs in construction companies, you know, twenty to fifty to five hundred employees, I'm definite, you know, I just have to need to spend enough time with them that you know uh, enough of them will convert to, to hit my goals. So why waste all your time running around looking for new leads all the time? Rather just decide exactly who you're going for and then you know hammer that list over and over. Yeah. No, I mean I love it. I, I read uh, or listened to on Audible the the book you're referring to, the it's called Traction. So uh, Gino Wickman uh over our kind of fall holidays and yeah it's i mean it's really great it's it's a really grown up book it's like how we should all be running our businesses but i think for anybody who's taking like growing a sustainable business seriously it's it's top notch yeah mm. i mean the stage we're at we got we, we all the paid advertising works for us in different levels like we also get a lot from captera and um 
you know, um, you know, pay other paid sources. But the problem with it is they all tap out. And then what do you do? You know, they, they get the, they get the traffic. Captera gets the traffic it gets. I can tweak my profile all day long. I'm not, I can't really drive. I can't really drive more sales with that. You know, it's, uh, it's once it's optimized, it's optimized. But um, this is a slightly more outbound, I'd say call this kind of an outbound light type thing. And then at least you're in charge of your own destiny, right? You're not dependent on what Facebook's going to give you for leads or whatever. At least you can go actually go and do something to go and find the leads you need to, to go to business. Yeah. Yep. Solid. Uh, so James, for folks who want to kind of reach out and chat more about LinkedIn prospecting and outreach, uh, where can they find you? Uh, Twitter, James Kennedy. And, um, if you don't have, um, if you don't have the LinkedIn pro tool, you could, I'd be happy to get on a Skype call and sort of, um, dig around with someone on, you know, defining a market like that. If, if you don't want to spend the 80 bucks, I'd be happy to help. And don't forget you can connect on LinkedIn too. <laughs> don't. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Awesome. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time today, James. And for everybody out there, what do you think about LinkedIn B2B connections out there? What are your experiences? Have you had success with it? Do you think James is full of shit? Do you think we're full of shit? I'm sure the latter is probably true, but we'd love to hear from you. (laughs) Send us an email podcast at roguestartups.com. And again, our ask for the year is still the same. If you felt like this episode was valuable, we'd really appreciate it if you'd share it with somebody who would benefit from it. Again, Happy New Year, everyone, and we hope you have a fantastic 2019. Thanks for listening to another episode of Rogue Startups. If you haven't already, head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show. For show notes from each episode and a few extra resources to help you along your journey, head over to roguestartups.com to learn more.